are dying to get in touch with your assholes, and so we're going to do that. Why are we going to do that? Because we're here to talk about somatic sexuality professionals, and what we do as a group, you're going to hear from each of us, but what we do as a group is we help people get into the body. So basically we're going to turn the volume down just a little bit up here, and we're going to turn the volume up just a little bit from the neck down. When I invited y'all to dance as you were walking into the room, that's one way to do that. And it's a super easy way that's accessible to you and to all of the clients that you work with. Another way to help people get into the body, turn the volume down on the brain and turn the volume up from the neck down is through breath. Breath is one of those secret keys that we all have access to. Why is it secret? Because we can control it and we cannot control it. We don't have to control it, right? So take a moment to just tune in to your body. You notice if it's clenched, you notice if it's not clenched. And as you breathe, imagine mindfulness plus imagination changes the felt sense. Mindfulness plus imagination changes what you actually feel. So imagine for a moment that you are breathing in as you breathe in through your mouth. Imagine that you're breathing in through your body. Just breathe in and breathe out. The bottom out through the bottom and then when you're ready and if it feels good for your body don't gotta you don't gotta do anything participation can look like a lot of different ways but if it feels good for your body when you breathe in through the mouth and you imagine breathing in through your asshole give a little squeeze and then when you breathe out and you release be sure that you're releasing that clenched anus right Asshole. The release being every bit as important, if not more so, than the squeeze. Right? Why? Because we're all walking around with tight asses. <laughs> like literally all the fucking time. So just concentrate on letting that go for a moment. Breathing in, breathing out, and just notice if you feel any different in your body than you did when you first walked in or than you did when I invited you to dance. And we'll have you tune in towards the end as well. And notice if you feel any different. And you might notice that you hear me saying notice a lot. And you might get that from, from all of us up here. That's a lot of what we do, is just invite people to notice what's happening. What's happening in your body? Actually, segues really well. Right before we introduce ourselves, we have a couple agreements for this space for everyone. The first and foremost being being mindful of your own well-being. And anything that we ever do is an invitation, meaning that no is just as easily accepted as yes. And so being attuned and attentive to your well-being as we go forward, paramount. We're also gonna be talking about touch work, people touching their clients. Does anyone, and you don't have to raise your hand, just internally gauge, does anyone fear for their license when I say those words? <laughs> Anyone's stomach like, <gasps> I'm gonna lose my life. Um, so my invitation, the second agreement is we're going to approach all the sensations in our body, all the sensations that emotionally come up to with curiosity first. We're going to be talking about different things that have a whole breadth of spectrum from, from much more platonic to all the way into sex. And when thoughts and feelings arise, approaching with curiosity first, critique, important. This room is full of analysts. <laughs> yeah, really important. Starting at curiosity and jumping from there. Um, we're also each going to talk about our professions and the scope of what we can talk about is really good for us to honor and acknowledge in that I can talk about my experience as a cuddle therapist from that lens. I cannot talk about the experience of every cuddle therapist and I'll get into that a little bit more into my, my profession. So my scope is limited to my experience and then my observation. And then we're also going to touch in on very briefly other touch professionals that aren't represented here. And again, we're, we're uh, the scope of what we can talk about is our experience to our perception of them and our experience of them as colleagues. So we're not saying that we know everyone's such experience and we are saying that we know exactly what it is like within those and as a client approaching those. So that's the limit of our scope there. Feel good? Yeah, that's great. Awesome. Should we do intros? Sure. sure. You want to take it away, Amy? Start us off. My name is Amy. Hi, everybody. Hi. So she, her. Um, I'm going to give just a little bit of my geosocial location so you know the lens through which I am coming from. Uh, I am white. I am cisgender.
gendered, I am queer, I am Jewish, I am divorced, I am a mother of two fabulous children, shout out. Um, I am a somatic sex educator and a sexological body worker, which puts me on the spectrum of a sex worker. Um, I stand on the backs of a lot of unacknowledged um, people who have done an incredible job at helping to heal the world, and I am very proud to be in that lineage. Um, and I also recognize that I have a lot of privilege. So, thank you. I am not Brian Gibney. <laughs> Thank you. Look at your handouts or the program. I'm Brandon Hunter Hayden. I've come in kind of the last minute. Brian wasn't able to be here with us today. Uh, but Brian and I are colleagues. We serve on the board of Embrace SBT Resource Group, which is one of the forms there. I'm a surrogate partner. Um, and an awareness of uh, my own background, I actually have a background in clinical social work. And so for me, it's actually been a journey of starting in the clinical realm and then moving into the semantic realm, pivoting wholly to this work. Um, so that's just a little bit of my professional orientation. Hi, I'm Keely, and I have been in private practice as a cuddle therapist for about 10 years. I am now the CEO and co-owner of Cuddlist, which trains other folks in the modality. I also sit on the board of directors for a nonprofit that trains facilitators on how to conduct workshops that are all based around boundaries of consent and uh, collaborative models of consent called Cuddle for Me. Um, and I like that, my geopolitical location, I like that. Um, Non-binary, queer, uh, white, partnered, polyamorous, uh, mostly able body, but with hidden, uh, with neurodivergence and hidden uh, chronic illness and um, middle, around middle class, so those are the lenses that I bring as well. Cool. We um, now are switching into, there are some common pillars that relate all the different kinds of touch work that we do, and there are sort of through lines and thread lines, and the degree to which they show up in anyone's private practice or in the, the fields is varying, but they're, they're almost always there and in very strong force. So we're going to go through the pillars of the touch work and the touch worlds. Then we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive because we've said these labels, cuddle therapist, surrogate partner, sexological body worker, somatic sex educator, and there is, I'm hoping, plenty of people in the room that are like, can you tell you what? What are those things? And so we'll go into a little bit about what those fields are and what are some of the other adjacent fields that are really close to what we do. Um, and then after we do all that, because that's not what we love talking, we're going to switch it in the primary function of this time that we spend together is all the questions. Because we can talk for a lot and it might not be very pointed on what your interests are or specifically how it relates to your practices, your um, client work, your care. And that's where we'd rather spend most of our time at, as opposed to presenting. So uh, first pillar, I can start with relational or we can do body work pillar to the Whichever you wish. Hmm? Whichever you wish. Cool. Um, Actually, I'm gonna keep, I like this like little thing, and plus I think the most obvious one is body. Okay. So let's start in the body. Okay. So we're gonna start in the body. Uh, I'm a somatic sex educator. We all are uh, somatic professionals. What does that mean? Soma is Latin from the Greek word that really means body. And uh, it means body not in the sense that we're used to thinking of bodies. Not in the off with your head and leave the body behind kind of thing, or just you know, trash that, let's, let's all walk around the world with these giant balloon-like heads and these thin little pin-like bodies, which is how most of us are in the world. But body in the sense of united mind, body, and spirit, if you believe in that. Alignment is what we're looking for. And when there isn't alignment, isn't that curious? Huh, what does that mean? Well, what does that feel like? Um, so that's what we mean when we talk about SOMA. Uh, and somatics, what we're trying to do is help people reunite with their bodies. Help people understand that the body is actually not something to be feared, but something to come home to. Something to come home to. Because most of us are not living in our bodies. We have fled our bodies, and our clients have fled our body, their bodies, for all kinds of reasons, right? 
Some of it is cultural conditioning. Some of it is trauma. Some of it is fear. My own entry into this work was through body shame. Lots and lots and lots of body shame caused me to flee. I was out riding my mountain bike one day going, woohoo, this is so much fun, I love mountain biking. And then I was like, okay, what do I actually feel? I didn't feel anything. Literally nothing. I was completely numb. So that's the kind of thing that we're talking about, is how do we go from being numb and come home to the body? And also why? So we're most of our, well, not most, I'll rephrase that a little bit. Way more information than we give credit is communicated in terms of our holistic mental well-being, mental emotional well-being, is communicated specifically in the body. Let's holler at Bessel van der Kork, Dr. Bessel van der Kork, for where trauma is stored, where it is experienced, which leads to another part of that divorcing of um, or, or conceptualizing, intellectualizing, being in a cognitive space, because that is often our thinking brain's safe place. It's the where we can conceptualize things as opposed to integrating it, as opposed to feeling it and coming back to those. If you were in the, the keynote just earlier, um, having that a bit trauma phobia because trauma lives so much in the body. And so by creating this, this titrated relationship where we can come into it in moments feel that maybe discomfort, that, that overwhelm, and then come back to the safety. Titrating back into what does it feel like when that's not scary? What does it feel like when we approach that with more curiosity? Um, but making that the foundation, starting here, because it's so easy and it's so much of our impulse, not just culturally, not just socially reinforced, but as, as survival mechanism, as adaptive coping, we go up here because that's where I'm not going to feel the pain, I can just conceptualize the pain. And so we make the body a safer place to come back to. And that's where a lot more of our information, I think we all have experienced this with clients where they will be so surprised at the touch of a hand on their back and they're in a memory, right? I think that's a pretty common, a pretty easily visual like grounding in that. Yeah. Anything else to add before we get into I'm just noticing right now my, my wish to disappear into the audience. Yeah, yeah. I have my own my own proximal wish to close the space with everybody here and then also uh, disappear and vanish. Yeah, I notice right now that there is a porcupine-ish sensation right above where my stomach would sit, right by my diaphragm, and I notice jitteriness in my hands. That is definitely, so all of this all this language that we build in these pillars is all that interoception, proprioception. And so many of our clients have no access. Or language, well, no, language. We all have access, we're born with that access. Right? Our bodies know, you will see a little kid, like a uh, toddler age watching TV, they're like halfway upside down on the couch, right? And like their bodies are doing the thing that their body wants. They have that, they have that interoception, proprioception, but we, we help clear away the garbage and the, the layers of conditioning and shame that gets on top. So let's, if I could just go rogue for a moment. Do it. <laughs> go let's, on let's take a minute to just notice whatever you notice and just name it out loud. So we'll just popcorn style. Say whatever it is that you're noticing. Uh, tension in my shoulders. Jaw. Jaw. Good. Belly's tight. Belly tight. Good. Yeah. I notice the weight of my glasses on my face. We were saying cold earlier. Lots of people saying cold earlier. So notice if just hearing what somebody else notices changes what you notice. For many of us, that answer is yes. So there's a relational component to this. This is a tool. A lot of the things we're going to talk about here are tools that you can do, tools that you can bring into your practice if you wish. This emotional relational awareness practice is one of those tools. You mentioned I'm noticing. You're noticing. You mentioned the keyword that kicks us into our next pillar. Yeah. So now we, we uh, you know, went ad nauseum in a good way on body. And the second pillar of these modalities is a relational format. Way more, I would say, on average than your traditional talk therapy, psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, psycho um, uh, psychiatry 
and there is a scariness I think often perceived in that relationality, but there's also a lot of magic in there. So what we're doing is approaching this from, uh, at the beginning of our sessions, I come with my commitments to my clients and they come with commitments to me. We're flattening some of this power dynamic, saying I'm not here to fix, I'm not here to heal, I don't have any magic that is, other than space holding and being with you with a regulated nervous system, holding <coughs> that space and well-being for you, and with some toolkits that we can explore at your leisure and at our interest together. But as much as their experience is shaping where we go and shaping what we do, my experience is there too and present in shaping where we go and what we do it. I'm reflecting it to them. Oh, I noticed in my body when you said that there was a restriction. There was a, clear, there was a recoiling of it. Can I share more of that with you? Where do you feel when I tell you that? Where do you feel in your body how that shows up? Or thank you so much for asking to spoon in my, in my world. And I'm not, I'm not emotionally ready for that. Let's, let's find a good approach, like a space where we can enter where we're both gonna be a big hell yes to this. And I'll let you know, I promise to tell you when I am there. So bringing my, my wholeness as a person um, to it and having them, if we get more and in a great way sandboxy in that aspect. It's one of the reasons why it pairs so beautifully and importantly with talk therapy. Psychoeducation, deep analysis, deep critical thinking can happen, an examination of lives and patterns can happen in the therapeutic space. And then in the somatic space, we feel the practical implication and the actual integrated experience and what that is. What was it like when I actually trusted you with this thing or when I let, uh, when I asked for your hand on my face, what did that feel like in my body? Where did my stomach go? Where did my shoulders go? And so they get to sandbox and test these things in a much more like controlled environment than like the bar. <laughs> Right? And so then they get to take all those experiences, all that experiential learning in that relational space where I'm being honest about what actually did happen and not, and not only holding the container of their, you know, um, it's still for them, but I'm still fully present there. So they're getting that real human experience and they go back to their therapist and they're like, this is what happened. Oh my God, I freaked out. Or this is what happened. And it was the best thing I've never experienced that before. So that's one of the reasons why it pairs so beautifully. And that's one of the magic places that we operate is in that flattened power dynamic. Any other bits for the relational piece? Cool. And we got one last pillar. You down? You down talking about the safety and ethics of it? I was going to say, what's my line? What keeps the relational safe? Yeah, what keeps the relational and experiential, so possibly highly charged elements of it? Accessible, safe, not your heart. Yeah, and I'm still, I find myself still reeling also from. talk as well and what are we talking about when we talk about safety um, and what are we talking about when we talk about risk um, I can't give someone safety in my work that doesn't come from me I can comport myself in an informed way with an awareness of myself my little little I can comport myself in a way that is uh, maybe more aware of my body of my social location of the circumstances that have brought a person and I into this dynamic together. Uh, but I can't give someone safety. Safety comes, in, in my experience, it comes uh, from a, a combination of structure, of discipline, and of irreducible risk. And my clients take a risk relationally with me, and I take a, I take a risk relationally with space. There is uh, at sometimes a thrilling and at sometimes a uh, mortifying pact that we make out of risk <coughs> that we share. Um, and that can be the birth of intimacy. Um, it can be the, uh, the hotbed of illuminated struggle that has never been able to uh, be animated either in the body or in word. Um, but as a surrogate partner, I show up in that space uh, to make, um, <clears throat> to really focus on 
the living dynamic and atmosphere of consent, which is far more dynamic than creating a safe space. Creating a safe space is not really something I have the power to do. I don't know your body. I don't know your history. I have very limited control. But through our interactions, through a cultivated awareness, and maybe even a shared language, a relational language, and sometimes, often, their language of touch, through the lens of consent practices, in the holding of the triadic model, which I'll, I'll talk more about again, which is uh, a, a collaboration between clinician, surrogate, and client. That's the holding, so that the client and I can take risks. Get off that rail. Um, there's also a good thing to be aware of when we have this conversation, and it speaks back to that scope piece. Um, most of our industries, there are certifications, there's really wonderful training programs that exist for them um, as additional and supplemental education to other clinicians who are doing other work and as its own modality. And we do not have the same infrastructure, the not, not the same tie to government and state as licensure boards and ethics boards. So what that means is that we really heighten the consumer education, your education around how to discern when a professional is going to be a great fit, when they're going to have the skill set that is going to make a great match for whatever healing, transformational care, support work that you're doing with clients or that they're doing. Um, and to be honest, I think it develops really good and important skills across the board that sometimes in some spaces can uh, the licensure and like the ability to go and check on psychology today can dull in those ability to like really key into is this person, not the number or the letters after their name, not their the stuff that they've done, is this person right for what I'm looking for and for me and my lived experience and is gonna see me. And so we, in terms of the broader safety of, of discerning experience and correct matches and who's gonna take really good care of people's well-being, there's more discernment required in the people seeking it out, which builds that skill in lots of ways. Are you, how are you gonna discern whether or not a partner is gonna be a really good partner to be with you? It extends all those skills and builds those skills, but it's something to be additionally aware of because it's not in other, in other spaces as crucial. There's, there's a wide variety of what safety can look like in each of our fields. Yeah, and I think it's important to say or to add yeah. um, to that, to, I want to say two things. One is I always thank people when they show up for having the courage to show up because really they're not showing up for me, they're showing up for themselves. And uh, that's a really hard thing to do, to make space for your sexual wholeness and well-being is a difficult thing to do. Um, how I help create safety, to, to Brandon's point, is I say to people, it's impossible to dive into pleasure. It's impossible to really, truly feel pleasure and allow yourself to raise that pleasure ceiling, because we've all lowered it for a variety of reasons, unless we have voice and choice. Those are the two most important things that help create safety. Voice and choice. So those are the things that we tend to work on. Um, the last thing I'll say on this topic of safety is that for me as a certified, I'm going to put that in quotes, as a certified somatic sex educator, that means that I, and I, and I belong to a number of different boards, that means that I have agreed to a certain ethical container. And that's something to look for as you are looking to work with somebody like us or as you're looking to refer to somebody like us. One of the things that is the most important thing to me about these ethical containers that I've agreed to step into when I do this work is peer supervision. So that's a really easy thing for you to look for as you're talking to people like us. Do you have a peer supervision group? Do you have um, an ethical container that you're stepped into? What does that look like? Can I read about that someplace? Right. So those are the kinds of questions that probably you and your clients are very used to asking when it comes to other um, you know, other sorts of professionals, mm -hmm. but sometimes people forget that we have, well, we don't have licensure boards, we do have organizations that we're a part of that help keep us accountable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We now are at the place where we can dive into a little bit of our each individual professions a little bit deeper. 
and we just talked for a bit. If you need to wiggle your body, if you move around, there's a, empty seats up here. If you're con, like having a hard time hearing us, we were promised AV equipment, and unfortunately things change. So, which is understandable. But if you need to move or adjust, take care of that whole being. Taking breath for it. does not involve genitals and it is never for the purpose of prolonged or increased arousal or sexual gratification. Um, there is a, I want to pause right there because what I fear sometimes people hear when I say that, especially at a conference labeled sex, is that we're not acknowledging or willing to bring in someone's sexual being. That's incorrect. Everyone's wholeness, the wholeness of them as a sexual being, is brought and welcome. We don't act on the physical exploration of what that means in the session. We keep it at the shallower end of the swimming pool with some really great floaties on so that we never tip so far into the, the intense overwhelm that can happen so as to prevent us from getting it the good juicy intimacy stuff. Because as soon as, you, if any of you have read, and I highly recommend it, and we're probably gonna talk about it way, way more, The Art of Receiving and Giving, The Wheel of Consent work by Betty Martin, as soon as you add sex into it, there is a different thing that happens. There also, there's you know neuroscience that changes a little bit there too, as opposed to more of the space of oxytocin, you tip over a bit more into like dopamine and serotonin, and then there's just a little bit of different balances that can come up. So, I do recognize and everyone's fullness is welcome, but we stay in that platonic container and explore. It is two-way touch, but we do that the beginning of every single session, um, and I'll specify this is the cuddlest method, um, with an opening agreement. And the opening agreement is there, shared by both practitioner and client, and it starts with an uh, agreement with both, if either of us are ever uncomfortable in any way, we're committing to the other person that we will say it. We will verbally acknowledge it and honor our well-being to the best of our ability. And we'll orient, more so than that, we'll orient towards comfort. To stay out of that realm of tolerating. I might not be so uncomfortable, but people's range for what so uncomfortable is, depending on how in touch with their body they even are, is a whole, that's a whole thing we spend a lot of time on, months on, in sessions sometimes. So we orient towards comfort. And if anything is it giving you those positive feeling, you acknowledge it too. We do that very slowly. We do it with a lot of modeling, because depending on where a client comes in, and their proprioception, their interoception skills and language around touching with the body, will go really, really slow. We're building up those skills. Um, so that's the first one. We're going to orient towards comfort and verbalize. And so I, I am also vulnerably asking them, and I make a note of it, like, I need you. I can be attentive to you. I'm not a professional or expert in this space insofar as I can't know what's happening in your body. So we make that really, really clear. The second thing is when anyone says or sets a boundary or, or says so, we honor it without pushing. We are, we're not going to push back any way that isn't um, curious and there and client-led. 
So when, when either of us, and we, um, there's lots of different techniques we use around this, like no yay is a, is a process that we do, or thank you so much for taking your, care of yourself every time someone says a no. We do a lot of ways in that. So the first one, we speak up. The second one, we uh, honor it without pushback. They're the expert of their experience. And then the last one is that we orient toward it being for the client. And so there's this space, especially with two-way touch, around reciprocity around giving, so like how do we navigate like them trying to please and getting out of their experience? Because what all we do is held within the container of it's for them, they paid me. And in the beginning of my sessions, I acknowledge it and make it a ritualistic practice of gratitude of you have given to me. I get to go on a vacation because of you. I get to go and have a really lovely dinner tonight because of you, you've given to me, thank you so much. So in this space, you don't have to worry about reciprocity to me. It's my turn to make sure that this is oriented towards you with one and two always in play. I'm never gonna do anything that's not oriented toward, toward my comfort. And so we start with that agreement, we build from there, and then um, can explore at whatever pace. And while cuddle therapy does have the word cuddle in the title, um, many, many, many instances require no touch at all. So I'll say one definition that I really like is cuddle therapy is the um, accessibility, the access to platonic touch in a container of well-being that affirms their life experience and gives them that, that return to humanity and that return to wholeness in their body. So that's a little bit about cuddle therapy. It ranges from uh, kind of three buckets of like just average self-care. I've got clients who are like, no, I just to cuddle because it feels really good um, and so just like they would go just like they would go to a massage therapist just like they would go to the spa every once in a while they treat it as self-care um, or they would go to the gym I have some clients who are working on personal growth and development how do I have better relationships with people this is all really scary trusting people is really hard I got some attachment shit makes sense we all do and uh, I want to work on that so that's what I'll walk on all the way down to um, I have developmental trauma around touch or um, uh, people who have had really intense developmental experiences um, or acute uh, traumatic experiences in their adulthood. Um, that whole spectrum is, is welcome and different practitioners will ha kind of have sweet spots. So, a little bit about it. Such a beautiful practice. And I think so every time I hear you talk about it, I'm like, I want some of that too. Do you want a book? <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see, putting on my hat, uh, I'm going to talk next, Fran, if that's okay? Cool, okay. Uh, putting on my hat of a sexological body worker, uh, which is one training that I'm certified in and one association that I'm a part of and an ethics board that I adhere to. Um, basically, sexological body workers are helping people feel more pleasure in the body helping people access more embodied pleasure. What that level is or where it is in the body, that's different, you know, we all, we all essentially have the same parts and pieces, but we're imprinted differently, as you all know. And so that level is different for everybody. Um, how we do that as sexological body workers, I kind of made up a phrase, I made up an acrostic, basically, that helps people remember what the tools are, it helps me remember what the tools are too and hopefully it'll work for you. But the phrase is, mm-mm, better sexy time. What does that mean? The first M is mindfulness, awareness. What am I actually focusing my attention on? Because somebody's trying to get me kind of like this, and I'm thinking about, shit, I forgot to start the dishwasher, or I forgot to do this thing at work. You can be sure I'm not fully receiving that gift, right? That's one very shocking example. <laughs> First M is mindfulness. The second M is movement. Inviting more movement into the body. It can be as simple as wiggling the fingers and toes. It can be as simple as opening and closing the eyes. Reminding the body that it can move helps with trauma response. And so we're basically building skills for people. And this is an easy one, movement, relatively easy. Squeezing and releasing the PC floor, your pelvic muscle, doing Kegels. Most important muscle for all of us, regardless of what kind of a body you're in, do your Kegels. Uh, mm -mm, better sex and time. B is for breath. Breath is a secret key. I already talked about that. But we can use breath to increase desire and arousal. We can also use breath to slow things down. So it's very, very helpful 
for controlling, maybe not controlling, noticing and having some awareness of where your nervous system is, right? Mm -mm, better sexy time, S is for sound. The autonomic nervous system, the sole nerve or primary source of um, transmitting information throughout the body goes from the back of the brain stem through the back of the throat down in female bodies to the uterus and male bodies to the pelvis. So when you allow yourself to make sound, uh, right, you're vibrating or enervating the back of the throat, you're moaning, right, those sounds can help feel good chemicals move through the body. So it actually enables you to feel more. Mm -mm, better sexy time, T is for touch and talk. It's not exactly self-explanatory, but I'll leave it at that. Um, so that's somatic sex education, or excuse me, that's sexological body work. Somatic sex education, that kind of puts me squarely in the middle here. The one thing I didn't say is we wear gloves for any internal or genital touch, and touch is one way only. I am touching my client, or the somatic sex educator is touching the client at the client's request and for the client's education. So in certain <coughs> states, that's legal. In the states where I practice, Oregon and Washington, that is legal. I also meet with clients on Zoom all over the world. So um, very easy to refer to that kind of a business, and it is one-way touch, or surprise modality, not business. Um, surprisingly, I've been really kind of shocked at how effective it is online, um, truthfully. I have been doing this work since 2017. I was working on Zoom before the pandemic. I've worked on Zoom all the way through. I love my one-on-one -on -one in person clients, but it's also really effective online. And some of it is because uh, the, as you all know, probably from the work that you're doing, the client is in their own space. And so there's a little bit more safety and a little bit more comfort there. And also, they can touch themselves. I don't need to touch them for their, for their experience and their healing and healing. So if I put on my other hat, my somatic sex educator hat, it's a broader grouping. Um, touch can be one way or two way. It can include um, things like surrogacy. It can include uh, intimacy educator training. The, the bottom line in all of it is that it is for the client. Our goal is to, number one, do no harm, and number two, support the client. I appreciate that you uh, bring on the virtual. We do a lot of work. Uh, my, my practice is um, almost split down the middle hybrid of virtual to in-person stuff. There's lots of hybrid stuff that we can do in the world of COVID. Do you want do you want us to tap in someone else? You feel good? Two poems. Two poems, yeah. Ooh. Poems. The bud stands for all things, even those things that don't flower. For everything flowers from within a self-blessing. Though sometimes it is necessary to reteach a thing its loveliness, to put a hand on its brow of the flower and retell it in words and in touch it is lovely until it flowers again from within a self-blessing. The end of poetry. <laughs> Enough of osseous and chickadee and sunflower and snowshoes, maple and seeds, samara and shoot. Enough char chiaroscuro. Enough of thus and prophecy and the stoic farmer and faith and our father and tis of thee. Enough of bosom and bud, skin and God not forgetting, and star bodies and frozen birds. Enough of the will to go on and not go on, or how a certain light does a certain thing. Enough of the kneeling and the rising and the looking inward and the looking up. Enough of the gun, the drama, and the acquaintance's suicide. The long lost letter on the dresser. Enough of the longing and the ego and the obliteration of ego. Enough of the mother and the child and the father and the child. And enough of pointing to the world weary and desperate, enough of the brutal and the border, enough of you can see me, can you hear me, enough I am human, enough I am alone and I am desperate, enough of the animal saving me, enough of the high water, enough sorrow, enough of the air and its ease, I am asking you to touch me. Thank you. I can only balance my crippling shyness we're making a fucking entrance again. <laughs> I have to do that, yeah. <laughs> I've made a transgression in, in leaving the room because I found that I was in a place that began in uh, wanting. I was very thrilled to be able to come in and support uh, my friend and colleague Brian to show up for y'all. 
And then I was, as I was up here, I'm deeply uncomfortable with standing in front of a bunch of people. I'm much better uh, in a more intimate space. Uh, so I found myself still willing for about 15 minutes. And then I felt my body cross over into enduring. And I wouldn't let myself do that, not even for you. Thank you. So this is an example of something that has happened in sessions with me as a surrogate partner. Sometimes a client will leave the room or in. They'll, and they, they, either they'll ask for, they'll ask, which is interesting, because why do they need my permission? Like, who are they asking for permission? Sometimes they ask me to leave. I once spent 25 minutes of a session in a hotel room with a client, and she asked me if I could sit in the bathroom with the door open, and we could talk like that so she could be in the, the main room. So that way she could stay in her window of capacity. The fact that she asked me that, something she had never asked anybody else for before. Wasn't that breaking the rules? Wasn't that awkward? Wasn't that weird to do that? Could she even ask that of me? I'm a professional, right? Upon whose authority did she make that request? So I'm a surrogate partner. I work in a clinical triad all the time in an alliance with a top therapist and a client. And, and in short, surrogate partner therapy is a relational modality that serves to address profound barriers to emotional and physical intimacy. That's what we do. I am the experiential component in this. In short, I offer a client a contained, contextualized experience that has touch on the table so that they can learn how to teach someone else how to be in relationship with them. I'm not teaching them how to be in relationship. I'm learning how to be in relationship with them. I might teach them skills. I teach them what my boundaries are. I teach them about my body. And they teach me about theirs. In a titrated, slow, collaborative process. And I, and I mean slow, at least in my experience. Mm -hmm. I want to clarify also, uh, I want to give you a moment to let the, let the term ring out surrogate partner, surrogate partner, not sex surrogate, not sexual surrogate, that is an outdated term. We actually just a month ago got it updated after a long battle with Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> so now the entry is surrogate partner, formerly sexual surrogate. I want to name that the, that the history of surrogate partner therapy comes from Masters and Johnson. They were the first people to recruit surrogates in their research. Modern sex therapy owes itself to surrogate, to surrogate work. Um, and as you might imagine, <laughs> the research was about uh, cisgender heterosexual male function, right? Because uh, what else were you going to fund at the time? Uh, and all of the first surrogates were cisgender white women, um, because who else is a, is a prized sexual object, right? And surrogate partner therapy comes from a legacy of functioning, restoring functioning, perpetuating the, uh, the, uh, the primacy of very specific bodies in a very specific world for its own propagation. The practice has evolved immensely now. When I work with clients, it's not to teach them sexuality, it's not to get them on a track to make them better at being uh, functioning in a sexual way. It's for them to have the chance with, with, a, with a curious, patient, and willing partner to learn what that even means to them. More than once have clients come thinking that they, they, they wanted to come to this work because they've never had sex, okay? Because they are traumatized, because they are profoundly anxious, because they're wounded, because they're broken. And in the course of our many months of work, they learn that the thing that they came in, the goal that they came in with was not at all a thing that they actually want. They don't even want it. And yet they were so convinced of their own need to have it being the source of their restoration, being the source of their belonging, being the source of their normativity. Many of my clients have found out that in fact, they're actually very kinky, and that uh, out of sexuality has nothing to do, or very little to do, with them living a full embodied, 
with a bit of gold. I don't know, truth. With a, an aliveness that they experience their own uh, presence and permission with. So I want to say, just to back up some things that have already talked about, surrogate partners are trained professionals. We have a training body, we have a certifying body. There's a discipline to it. The discipline is constantly evolving, as it should, to be responsive to a new understandings and relationality. Um, and the holding of this work really comes from the power of the triadic model, and I can't emphasize that enough. It is that relationship, the three-way relationship. It's my relationship with you, your relationship with the client, the client's relationship with me. In our first meeting altogether, we do something called a triadic meeting. This is after maybe a first, an initial back and forth with the client, where we'll uh, uh, explore just what it is. I want to make sure they understand what it is. Some people are looking for sex work, which is perfectly valid. Um, I consider myself, uh, I consider sex workers of all stripes to be my peers, and I'm in solidarity with that. Um, and if it's right, then we have a triadic model. And that's a chance for the client to observe how I, I interact with the therapist. I observe how they interact. The therapist observes how I interact with the client. It's the, it's the, the, the emergence of, of a sense of this relationship that is the container that's the whole. And then I go off and I have my sessions with clients. After a session with clients, uh, I will have a brief meeting with the clinician to check in, to review our treatment plan. Um, the client will have their regular session with the therapist. I have a meeting with my mentor, who's a certified surrogate. So there's many elements of holding. I imagine the therapist has supervision of some sort. Um, and there are groups now that didn't exist before but those of us who have built them now are now there for support for surrogates, for clinicians, um, for clients. And so there are additional supports in place. So there's a lot of holding, so that within that holding we can take risks. Cool. I appreciate that you also um, acknowledge, both you in the very beginning, and you acknowledge sort of where things are coming out from and the evolution of them. Just also acknowledging that a lot of the a lot of the techniques that I think a lot of us use, but I'll specifically name cuddle therapy. I mean, these are in, in more indigenous wisdoms. There, people have been doing this forever. When I say the cuddle therapy world is about ten years old, I mean just in that term, not in what we're actually doing, right? Just in if you were to Google a thing, that's about, about when it started showing up. So standing on those those facts and that wisdom using techniques like tapping and things like that with the Meridian system. So we were at Psych Networker just <laughs> two weekends ago, back here, um, chatting with like Deb Dana and uh, talking about Stephen Porges and whatnot. They're like, oh yeah, tapping EMT, right? Like we're, we're the vagus nerve ends on the, yeah, the Meridian systems. Yeah, <laughs> that, that wisdom has been there for a very long time, even if uh, Western venison is justifying it now. Yeah. Yeah. This is the part where we get to kick it. Yeah. And I. Yeah. Thanks for having me right there. I'm curious if you all have experience working with autistic clients. Mm -hmm. And if that's what you can speak to that. Oh, you just became one of my favorite people. I'm autistic and ADHD, and that's my right. like primary folks. Yeah. The way in which um, neuro uh, atypical folks, neurodivergent folks navigate relationship, navigate communication, navigate the sensory experience of the world and their bodies is really unique. And so I think that when you're navigating, I think those are so crucial to identify if that's something that is really present for a client in their experience. And this kind of work is some of the most powerful shit you can do. Because if you're like, hey, I have to, we talked about being floating heads, right? If you're in an autistic body and every sense it's turned up to 11, that is just adaptive. Good job, your body, for disassociating and keeping you safe and alive and walking around the world, because otherwise it's hell, right? And so the ability of, or the, the practice of titrating the body, when, it, when, can it feel, when can it feel safe? When can being in my body, do we turn all the lights down? Do we, my, my space is a scent-free space? Do we, um, only do compressive touch? Do we only do feather touch? What kind of touch is the thing that your skin isn't gonna crawl away from? And then, in addition to like all of that really important titration, figuring out how does it feel safe in my body, 
then how you communicate that around you. It's not that you're broken, it's not that your neurotypical partner wants you to have more blah, 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 it's that the way in which we connect is this really beautiful but very specific way and like that's why it's gorgeous. So there's lots of that discovery that happened and thanks for asking that question. Um, an additional, mm -hmm. I wanna just take it. I, so far in my experience as a surrogate, I have not worked with anybody who has identified as or, or either through self-diagnosis or clinical diagnosis. Um, I have my hunches. <laughs> uh, regardless, my approach is the same, which is I have a non-prescriptive approach to the relationship, to touch, to a trajectory. It's a responsive relationship. So me learning the language of, of, of communication, right, of, of stimulus processing, it's all the same. I do that with all my clients. And so uh, I try to have an approach that um, is going to be open and responsive to a person's unique style and, uh, of, of, their, of their different needs, um, their access needs, their processing needs. Um, and we're paying such close attention to what's happening in our bodies and in the space too that I feel like it gives me an opportunity to get in touch with um, even fast differences. Of, uh, did he, anybody go to the, uh, the Sex on the Spectrum talk? Yeah, the other day? it was awesome. It was it was awesome, and I and I love. I mean, essentially, the conclusion from that was um, was the utility ultimately of, of being willing to uh, to be humble and curious in your work, right? Which is which is essentially uh, it's great. A little bit of feedback. Love that, love that, love that, love that noise. Um, <laughs> uh, you don't always just hear that noise. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't. I don't. I mean, I did earlier. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That was magic. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. I like that so much better than the sound of my own voice. Are you passing? I'm passing it. Yeah, yeah. Good job. Thank you. Uh, I have worked with a number of folks uh, with various levels of neurodivergence. The most profound one was probably last year. I worked with a quite a young man, 23 who um, didn't have access to speech and used a letter board. And that was, that was quite a thing for me um, to try to follow along. And uh, similar to what Brandon is saying, and, and Keely too probably, look like this isn't a 12-step program, right? It's not like I'm walking everybody through the same thing. It's very much tuned into what does this individual need first thing that I do with the client is I say, they walk into my studio and I say, where would you like to sit? And they kind of look at me and they're looking around. And I always have kind of two relatively large chairs to fit all bodies, make sure people are comfortable, um, available. And I also have lots of other space in the room. So they find some place to sit. And then I say to them, where would you like me to be? And what does that feel like? Because it feels very different if I am sitting side by side, or if I'm back to back, or if I'm 20 paces away, right? Each of those locations feels a little different in the body. So I'm very rapidly letting the client know that this is for you. And this isn't about tolerating or enduring. This is about what actually feels good for you. And a lot of times they don't know. They've never been asked that question. Okay, well, you know what? Get up, try a different seat. How does that one feel now? It's like going to the eye doctor, right? Which is better? Which is better? I don't know, right? And then all of a sudden, it's like, oh yeah, there's a little more sharpness on that. So we bring those things into, into the room. How would you like the lights? Oh, this is okay. We're not going for okay. Okay, but gets fine. Nobody wants fine sex. We all want fan-fucking-tastic. We all deserve fan-fucking-tastic, right? And that means we don't endure, we don't tolerate, we don't go along. We get to be the, the kings, the queens, the gods, the goddesses, whatever word the rocks are, whatever word works for you. But in that moment, it's not about going along for those moments. So that's what we're teaching. Two things come to mind for me um, based on those two things. Um, the deconstructing of societal scripts, mm -hmm. because we're building them from moment one, can be both so comforting and accessible 
to a lot of folks with some intense neuro spice and really jarring. I have been told that I need to know these unspoken social scripts and, I'm, and you are giving me this sandbox and I don't have my scripts and so we navigate that or attentive to that as much as we can be um, because the other side of it often, very, very often, is a very like, oh, I don't have to do that. This expectation that was set on me, I don't have to have anymore. And then when we're talking about the more, more like deep into the, um, functional, social, communicative challenges of autistic experience. Um, we sometimes are talking about folks who, uh, we all work in 18 and over spaces, but who qualify for that, but their developmental or their, their engagement is at varying different degrees of what we would experience an age, right? And so uh, I had an amazing client whose parents I was speaking primarily with the parents, and they had taken him to Amsterdam so that he could get sex work, and he just cuddled with that sex worker. And then what we figured out and what was really interesting and, and a challenging dynamic to navigate in that space is what the other people in uh, someone's life have an expectation for them and their experience and what they should want and what they should have access to versus what their embodied experience and desire is. And that can look pretty drastic, drastically different. And so some of the challenges there are, no, your client, uh, like, your client, your friend, your, your loved one, who, who you facilitated this relationship with me, what their body is saying, what they're communicating in whatever way they can communicate is like these levels or a check-in of like progress is going great, don't, no more pushing. And like then managing that person, that guardian, expectation around it because the you know neurotypical folks in their life might need psychoeducation around that they might need that so it ends up being interesting mm -hmm. another way to say that is who's it for yes who's it for Being very attentive about who it's for yeah great question thank you yeah. um, <clears throat> are there any exclusionary criteria that y'all practice with for example like what comes to mind for me is that a lot of people who exist throughout the day in a numb manner um, find a way to safely experience sensation like through substance use. Is that something that excludes clients from your guys' work? Great question. I think we all got different things. For me, in my practice, um, there's a code of conduct guideline that you can find on any of the places I practice that we agree to be free from mind altering subject substances so much so that we can engage in consent. So that has some pretty intense nuance there. Uh, I have the experience of a, I work um, in recovery spaces often, and someone who, is, and I practice harm reduction. I'm a harm, I'm a harm reduction uh, philosophy approach to it. I've had clients that are are so deep into alcohol addiction, they would be if they had no had nothing in their system at all, they would be in active withdrawal and they wouldn't be able to consent at all at that point, right? But so there is a line in which we have to navigate what the reality is for the person. There's also an extension. It doesn't. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Woo. Oh, woo. When I know, just rip it out of the fucking wall. <laughs> <laughs> My whole body just like, oh, a little bit peaceful. That's the you blow on a cartridge. You know, yeah. <laughs> we were all enduring. <laughs> Sometimes the, we don't want to do. Let's titrate back. Yeah. Um, uh, where were we? Recovery spaces. Recovery spaces, yes. And so we navigate that. There's also an offshoot that um, can exist of like trip sitting. Mm -hmm. Trip sitting and so that we would call an, um, a, like you need additional education for. So if it was a cuddleist doing trip sitting, they wouldn't be operating under the cuddleist model because the intent is to explore in that container. And so they would have additional training or they would have something supplemental to do a different modality. But absolutely. Next question? Oh, around substances. substances. Are there, are there exclusionary, exclusionary criteria? criteria? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, in my experience, I, I think it's up to the practitioner. 
different practitioners at different comfort levels and also different backgrounds and familiar, familiarity with things. For me, uh, again, being able to, to give consent, uh, for some folks, they might actually require something like an edible or something like that in order to in order to enter into a space that is uh, not so distorted right, or full of static for them that they feel like they have more capacity to engage. My request is that part of that consent means that they let me know that, the, that the, that's going to be a part of it. That's the thing that matters to me most. Can we talk about it? Can you tell me that this this might be an access need that you have? Can you tell me that this is a thing that helps you become more present or fluent with yourself? So that's really the thing that matters the most to me. I might have specific hangups, in which case I would say that. I'll talk about that. But I don't have a flat answer in that sense. I have um, an intake and waiver form that I require anybody I work with sign. And some of the things on that form are um, I'm 21 or older. I um, don't have any of these various medical conditions that list a whole bunch of things. Um, I have access to feeling in my body. I'm not on, um, I'm not going to show up impaired in some way. Um, so those sorts of things. And I require that so that I know in part what's going on with the client, but it doesn't take the place of having any conversation. That all still needs to be discussed. Um, and I also feel like it protects me and my practice um, from liability. So um, I always ask when somebody shows up and they're having uh, erectile dysfunction, which is a rather big thing in my field, um, if they've been to the doctor, if they've had a stress test, when's the last time you had a physical, right? So those sorts of things. I wouldn't call it necessarily exclusionary, but it's important to be checking those boxes and just making sure there isn't something, some underlying health condition. The other thing that I think is really important for you to know is that um, I have a checklist that's part of the resource guide. If you, if you all click, there's a resource guide um, online, but that includes my checklist. And my checklist is basically, am I ready to see a somatic sex educator? And it includes things like, what is the mental support that I have? What is the emotional support that I have? Is my body physically supported? Am I right now getting enough sleep? Am I eating well? Am I getting enough exercise? Because these are all things that can impair um, working with somebody like me and effectiveness at what we do. Broadening that, um, it just came to mind. I'm noticing also and being self-conscious about always feeling like I end up like, dovetailing up with everybody. You're very inspiring people. Um, <laughs> The biggest exclusionary practice that I have is my internal yes. I don't ever, ever take a client that uh, in a consultation, I have, there's no just booking, we have a consultation that I'm not a hell yes to working with. And it can be for any reason because I am not going to be the right practitioner for that person if I can't show up to that space with a full embodied yes to working with. It may not be a full of body yes to all kinds of touch with that person, but that's the number one exclusionary practice, and it's in human to human to human based. So just practicing that. It, this the way we are trained, the way that um, touch professionals are trained. Again, referencing that ex the relational piece is I'm bringing the full breadth of what my experience is, including my intuition, my gut, my my sense of connection. One more thing, I'm sorry, before we take that question. The last thing I want to add along these lines is that um, I think I mentioned before, it takes a lot of courage for somebody to reach out to us. It's kind of like they're desperate. They're at the end of their rope. They haven't been able to find help for this one thing, whatever it is, anywhere else. And it's there's a lot of guilt and shame that people come to us with. So when I say no to working with a client, um, I'm always referring them to someone. Want to just leave them hanging. And the same thing is true if they're asking for something that they desire in a session. If it's something that I'm not a yes to and I say no, we're going to celebrate the asking. I'm going to celebrate their being able to ask. And I'm going to reframe the no for them as this is me taking care of myself. This is me honoring my own boundaries and my own limits. This is how we do it. Right? 
So it's very clear. There's a, there's a modeling that happens, and there's also a hand-holding that happens. Awesome. So there was a question in the back. I just want to say on that, too, you brought up something for me, which is, which is kind of inherent, again, to the atmosphere that we build, is what is it like for the client to experience in the presence of another person um, desire without fear or desire with fear and that fear to be alive in the room with us to be in their body with us for them to make it speakable and I don't turn away from it what about if they what if they were able to experience uh, grief without punishment or to receive a no without shame or the shame is there and we look at it together hold it in the, in the light of whatever kind of relationality we have. It's a very different experience than many of us have. That's part of what we build. The content of what we actually do is actually quite secondary to that dynamic. The sort of radical presence. Um, there was something else that I was going to say that I think I'm going to call in motion. You're crying now. I'm crying. So. <laughs> Because, I mean, this, that's my question. Yeah. Um, I'm fighting this urge to like, like while I was sitting here thinking about my question of wanting to run away and hide. Yes. Um, and then like sanitize, you know, make it like a more professional so I don't look like a mess. In the last talk, it became really clear to me how much terror I face internally, which obviously limits where I can show up in my own confidence. And every time I hear synthetic professionals talk about the work that they do, hearing you guys, hearing other people in my life, family members and friends, conversations that we've had. Um, that is terrifying because there's such hope and possibility in what you're talking about, like all human knowledge. Um, that just seems very clear, but I know that, but I don't feel that. And I have terror for my own life around touch. And so I'm wondering if you guys can say more to just how deep the terror can be, both for your clients when they come into you but also for all of us here, um, whether we're worried about losing professional status and working with you guys, or worried about losing other parts of our life or people in our life by showing up more authentically in this way. I was wondering if you could speak to that terror. Thank you. Thanks for being brave enough to ask mm -hmm. that question. Terror is like, what if the bottom drops out? And we make space for okay. Let's feel what that feels like because we I know. I as the I am this person and doing this for 10 years, I know you will be okay. I know for certain that I will not leave, even if you're not okay. We're gonna be here and feel it. And you'll find your resilience and you'll find your connection. At the very least, that's what always, that, and I hate using absolutes, but that's what always happens in session with you and with mo 
most of my colleagues say we're focused. It's it's really crude to say that the, the core fears, I know it's not as simple as this, but often the, the core fears underlying most, most of the ordeal of being a human uh, are the fear of abandonment and the fear of obliteration. And for me, it's in, the, it's in the practice of the work with my clients. I'm also aware of the body that I'm in. I'm aware of the terror that is evoked by the body that I'm in. I'm also aware of the things that uh, I'm not an analyst, so my language is going to be, you can scoff at my language here, but I don't turn away from my own shadow. I know the legacy I carry. I'm aware of maybe what is exigent sadism, okay? <laughs> maybe what is destructive sadism. I'm aware of the coward. I'm aware of the quivering child. I'm aware of the predator in me. If I don't turn away from that, that means I am more likely to not turn away from my client's terror of me, or the terror of the world. I think that terror is necessary in our work, if it's, if it's authentic, if it's, in this, if it's in the body, if it's in the space. I'm not there to alleviate the terror. I'm there for that person to be less alone with it, maybe for the first time, and not turn away. I will neither abandon nor obliterate them because of my own shame, or to save myself from the discomfort of that moment. And if I do, I'll own it. Let's just take a breath. Every somatic professional I've met does this work because it's calling, because we're on our own healing journeys, because we have walked on this path and walked through the fucking fire and want to shine a flashlight back to help the people just a little bit, maybe just a couple steps behind us, maybe way back on the path, I don't know. But it's a, it's a human experience that we've had and a calling to want to make it a little bit easier else. Um, my personal belief is that our bodies want to turn towards health and wellness in the same way that a plant wants to turn towards the sun. And I'm just helping people find that sun. I don't know what the sun is for them. I only know what my own sun is. But I create enough space using curiosity, openness, acceptance, and loving kindness. That acronym, which comes from uh, Dan Siegel, COAL, C-O-A, curiosity, openness, acceptance, and loving kindness, that's what I offer. And that Petri dish of particularly loving kindness, but all four of those, somehow it's like an al alchemy. It, it, it magically is able to transform people, not because I'm doing anything, because they're in the Petri dish with me and something unfolds or opens and then something changes. So it's very um, powerful and transformational work, not because we're the experts or the sexperts. Sometimes people are like, you know, you just do your thing, Aim. You know, you're the expert. No, it doesn't work that way. It's, it's tuning, it's helping them tune into their own voice, to their own internal wisdom, the truth of what they feel, their own, you know, GPS, okay? Not some other thing, not something out here. That's the... That's the part that allows people to change and to feel like come home. Again, come home to the body. Allow yourself to desire. Like, think about all the wants that get just watered down and not asked for. Right? We all have un 
unspoken wants. We might even not even allow ourselves to name those wants. So getting in touch with the wants and being okay with the fact that we're not going to get everything we want. But desire is an essential part of being human. And noticing where that lives in your body. And then noticing why you ask or don't ask. What are the tools that we can pick up around that? What allows us to be a little bit braver with our desires? Some things we want to come true and some things we don't, right? What are those things? First of all, thank you all. I'm glad I'm here. Um, I've been thinking a lot this conference about about psychoanalysis and the journey of my own self as a practitioner, and where psychoanalysis has come in terms of owning my position and myself, you know, geopolitical position in the world. And and I find myself sitting here with you all, very grateful to understand it, but also wondering about your own sexualities and how that is in your work, you know? Because I'm thinking a lot about where about my own and how it's in, it is in my work and where it rises up and my own needs and wants and when that is and how that is held in the, in the dyadic space. So if that is Great question. useful to you, I'd love to hear a little bit of that. You also said about, which I was also in my mind, like you were brought to this work because of something. Yeah. A calling that has to do with you and the units. I'd love to hear a little bit. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll just go first. Sure, okay. absolutely. Um, let's see. Okay, so my own healing journey, which I won't bore you with, but uh, started really with, with body shame and feeling like I was robbed. Like, I used to love to climb trees and dance and do all kinds of things that puberty and patriarchy and the sex night of sex shaming shitty culture that we live in stole from me. Um, so I also had these, I, I didn't think I could orgasm. I had these really small little teeny tiny sneeze. Betty Dodson called them sneezes, like sneezy orgasms. Um, and I wanted like the full-on Meg Ryan, like, empowered, you know, <laughs> she could do it thing that everybody else seemed to have. Um, and I felt like I couldn't, I somehow didn't have access to that. Um, so that's part of my own story. What I think is really important comes back maybe to the ethical container, which is, uh, for me, and it, it may be different for all of us, but for me, um, I have to take care of my own needs so that I have the capacity to show up. I'm gonna use the word clean, but I don't really like that word. Cleanly for my clients. Um, so in other words, I'm not trying to get my own needs met in a session with my client, and one of the ways that I'm sure that doesn't happen is because I do my own table work. I go to my own therapist. I get, I get massages. I do my own work so that I can show up and like, kind of like I think Brene Brown would say, like I, I'm willing to sit in the dark with people. And I tell people that sometimes my desire shows up. And if my desire shows up, I'm not gonna squelch it. It's welcome in the room, but I'm choosing not to follow it because I'm there in service of the client. So there's a discussion that happens. Um, quite often. Sometimes I don't actually do any touch work with my clients because all they really want to do is talk. Um, but when there is touch work, uh, that is always something that I touch on. And it's really a way of modeling for them um, what they can do with their own desires and with their own libidos. Um, because sometimes it's not appropriate. Right? And, and sometimes it is very much welcome. So it's a it's a it's a statement of how I show up, but it's also teaching me that. Something I'll say about that too is is we go through the distinction between arousal and desire, physiological arousal, as opposed to desire, desire to enact something, um, and that includes talking about the the power of having a fantasy, and and even sharing a fantasy 
in the, in the disclosure, right, or in a playful nature, um, does not mean that that's a fantasy that he wants necessarily to be enacted. But there's a power in the, in the confessional quality, right, in the disclosure. It's, there, there's still a sharing, right, an intimacy in, in disclosing that fantasy. Um, and so we, we spend a lot of time parsing those things out because physiological arousal may or may not occur when it's, when it's appropriate or not appropriate, right? The point is, can we, can we speak to it? Can we notice it, first of all, in our body when the arousal happens? And then, uh, if it's perceptible, to, to speak to it, and then just, just as Amy said, to say, yeah, I'm, I'm noticing this. My body is doing a thing, as bodies do. Um, and that's not, that, that's, that doesn't mean that my arousal needs to be centered. And so that might be, that might be a pretty radical message uh, when I'm working, for instance, with a, 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 a cis woman or an AFAB person or, or uh, somebody who's been uh, socialized feminine, to hear from you for the first time, oh yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm experiencing arousal and it's not the point. <laughs> right? What happens when my body or, or its specific states no longer become the center of our interaction or even something that is, has to be dealt with? Um, in, if erotic phases of the work are indicated, then my sexuality, my, my ability to tap into my desire, my erotic, has a place in the, uh, and I, I always imagine it in, in the wheel of consent model. So there's like serve, accept, take, allow. And my, um, my desire would still live in a small part of serve. Because if we're doing erotic work, there are things we can go through to, in order to provide an experiential moment, right? If the client really wants to explore something, we can do that. And I can do that in the spirit of play. I can do that in the, in the spirit of willingness, in good faith. But there's also a distinct gift in someone hearing and holding my, my desire, once we build the relationship for that, because that's something that they're, ostensibly they're gonna to wanna to experience in relationships in the world after our work is done, is how to receive a, a request, or to hear a, a, a request, or to just hear about a desire. Right? So there, there can be a gift in my disclosure, it also flattens the power between us in that moment. The number one question, just to fill in that, the number one question I overwhelmingly get from cis men who uh, seek this work is what happens if I get an erection? Yeah. Um, and we it, go through that whole thing. Like, cool, your body's your body's body. Awesome. Then we get to decide what we want to do with it, and we're not going to pursue it. So what else are we going to do? Um, and we and there's very sweetly and very compassionately. There's there's lots of like shame and whatnot that can come up with that. And so we work through all that in very loving. One, the thing that I uh, that I want to add, because they've said this beautifully, is I my experience of this work is first I learn, then I integrate, then I can do. I can't I can't I have to be the living embodiment of their point B. I have to be the possibility of what it can look like to sit in a, sit in that presence, to be that regulated nervous system, to bring my full and open, full of sexual self to a space, and know that I'm comfortable and confident. In it. So if I if I I have to do a f metric fuck ton, and we're in America, so we're using the metric system. It's already a hit, but a fuck ton of personal work outside of session. So that I can bring it there from that that grounded place, from that um, curious, compassionate, welcome space, and be like, yeah, cool, this is great. Also, it shows up in like the modeling. A client could really want to. We do this all the time um, in in face to face position, like caress my face. And how my sexuality might show up is, you've not done anything wrong. You've not violated any boundaries. This is completely within everything that we've agreed and consented to. And I am feeling a sexual memory in this moment, and I need to uncouple. We need to take a break, a breath, a step away. My full sexuality and self is there. And then I hold space for me and hold space for their reaction to it. 
so I gotta, I gotta fucking live all that shit <laughs> all day long every day. So no, you know, it's not, I love it and I live it and it's a good thing. Um, but that's how that shows up a lot. It's the not being afraid of it. And then what I'm modeling is exactly what I want them to do. Like, oh, we're in this position and I'm, I am reminded I'm getting really sexual feelings, but that's wrong, that's bad. I'm not supposed to do that because we're in a platonic container and oh fuck. And <gasps> I want them to know that like, just naming that, like, oh, this, I'm starting to spiral. Cool, great, how do we adjust so you're comfortable? What's the small adjustment that we need to make that takes us out of this intensity? And so modeling that every time I feel it genuinely. There, I saw that one and then, I just question in the back. Quick, yeah. jump, jump right on you said, how do you, um, how do you address that with a patient or a client that is then maybe unconsciously seeking out the service for that exact reason? We talk about it. I've had, well, I mean, had I, a, what they would know is what I'm saying. Like, I, I think yeah. he's a practitioner. Uh, yeah, kind of so we, like, it's pretty, the consultation process we set out pretty easily once you've been doing this for a minute and then like you can ask questions, right? Questions that'll get there a little bit. And then uh, real life experience, had, went through the consultation, it was great. We get to the session, client places themselves in the room, their own chair, and I ask, well, where do you want me? And like we go through the like presencing, where is your body? Where's your desire? What's going on? Like, I want you on my lap. I'm like, this is our first touch. How about anything else? Well, I'm like, okay. Would that be really exciting for you? Yeah. All right. Do you want me on your lap because like that'd be really arousing? Yeah. Awesome. Is there anything else that would also feel about as good, even if it weren't arousing? Or is that like that's that thing you want? It's like, no, that's it. I don't really want to do anything else. Awesome. This is a great discovery. We're gonna get you, and like, there's, this was, there's a lot of handling, I don't have to recreate the whole thing. But we stopped the session right there. What is the first five minutes of the session? We stopped it, I actually gave them a refund. I was like, you want something, and it's okay to want it, and that's beautiful. I'm not, I'm, this isn't the right place. Let's find you the right place. I love this analogy that I give a lot of people who are really, they're confused about the sexual component, sex work part of it, um, they intentionally, unintentionally, whatever. It's like you're not gonna go to a color, cardiologist to get diagnosed with cancer, right? You're just in the wrong. We're just in the wrong room. You just gotta go to the right room. So I don't have a stigma against all those cardiologists. I'm like no, <laughs> you just gotta get to the right room. That's it. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, as I'm listening to you, I'm I'm hearing you talk about like modeling boundaries um, with apologizing for your body. Um, and I'm thinking about myself in, in sessions, um, I'm thinking about um, as a clinician, talk therapist, as a sex therapist, and I'm thinking about this pressure um, as I, you know, am seen as an like, expert um, or seen as a you know, specialist um, to be like perfect. I'm thinking about how like virtue is in the way of error and in the way of humanity. I'm wondering if, if any of y'all and, and Hula are kind of speaking to like the fuck ton of work that we gotta do. Like if, if any of y'all have exemplified um, uh, or, or think of an example really of, of when you're working with um, uh, a client's desire, a client's um, uh, coming to understand the, their power um, of no, um, when you were like, you had a no shit moment um, and weren't, you know, quote unquote perfect, and you rejected that yourself. Oh, hell yeah. I got two things to say to this. I, I hope they'll answer it. But as you were saying, it's those two things. One's about pedestals, and the other's about rupture repair. So we'll go with rupture repair first. Rupture repair, modeling what that can look like without the break of attachment within a really great container is one of the most profound fucking things you can do with someone. Like, uh, I, with my ADHD, sometimes I fuck up client appointments every once in a while and like we'll skip a telehealth appointment accidentally. And I had a client in a pretty, and I knew they were in a pretty intense spot and whatnot. And so we went through this like whole rupture effect. Like they, they texted me uh, intoxicated and really, really angry because I had spaced and wasn't there on that day. Like, how could you abandon me like this, right? And so then we had one of the most incredible sessions, like for our next session, that we've ever had of this really powerful, beautiful, 
like they were coming there with their justifiable, understandable, and I was holding presence for their very real anger at me fucking up. You're right. I totally fucked up. I hurt you. I hurt you in the way that like is the worst for you right now. Oh my God, that's so hard. And they texted me some pretty shitty things when they were drunk. And so they were, having, they were in this huge shame spiral. They're like, now I don't get to feel mad. I don't, I'm not allowed to feel mad because I did that too. And I'm like, yeah, that hurt and I'm not going anywhere. I know you, I know how kind you are. I know where you were that was hurt. I can look at that hurt part knowing that I did that. And you can look at me knowing that I care. And that, and like, oh my God, it was like the fucking greatest. <laughs> I don't work with that person since they were like, oh, oh, that case study is something I'm gonna write about them one day, they're awesome. Um, so there's that, the rupture repair process is maybe one of the deepening relational things that we can do. The second thing is this idea of a pedestal, where the expert were up on a pedestal. What that thing does, when you're on a pedestal, you're alone. We're not in relation. When you're on a pedestal, it's precarious and dangerous because you could fall, and you fucking will. Pardon my, all my French, y'all. <laughs> That's how I am. Um, and you're not in community, you're not in connection. If someone is on a pedestal, this is why I also have a special interest in like celebrity culture and what that does psychologically, and like all. Um, but yeah, when someone's on a pedestal, you're not in, you're not relating to them, you're not in community with them, you're not present with them, and they're alone, and you're alone, and so that, that importance of flattening, that me being real, is the only way we can actually connect. If, I'm, if I have to be perfect, then they're not free to make mistakes either. Yeah. Can we get to this question back here in the back right? Hi. Hello. Uh, Hi. I'm C, grad student. I'm wondering if you have any um, people, places, experiences that you would recommend or that you would think are more integral to you to get into where you are, if it has to be a body of work, okay. Well, I <laughs> <laughs> First and foremost, a thing you can do on a Saturday afternoon that was literally my gauntlet and the thing that kicked off my entire life coming out of insurance is where I was, uh, a cuddle party. Sp TM actually from the 501c3 facilitator, a cuddle party. The boundaries and consent workshop and the space to explore that, that's the thing. It's a four hour event. The first time I ever went there, I cried for about two hours of it and it changed my whole life, including getting me out of a DV situation in my relationship and repairing all of the relationships with my family. So like, you just want fun experience of people, a place, a thing, My thing was I went to a, a <laughs> I went to a workshop that Betty Dodson used to give that I now facilitate, and it's called Body Sex. And um, yeah, has anybody else in this room been to Body Sex? Okay, me and Michelle. And here I we are. I wish that every person in a female body could take this workshop. It is so good. Um, cuddle party for sure. Uh, the other thing is. Uh, two other things. One is Wheel of Consent, which I also teach. I tend to facilitate the things that have been really important tools for me personally. So Wheel of Consent is one of those things. Keely mentioned it before. Uh, it's Betty Martin's work. There's tons of videos online. Free. It's extremely accessible. Free. Lots of free content for Wheel of Consent, Betty Martin. It's phenomenal work um, about consent uh, that is not permission oriented um, and about boundaries and limits. And, and also about survival and adaptive strategies. Um, a lot of stuff would probably resonate for folks in this room. The last thing I'll say is on that resource sheet, I have a, a thing that says, please email me if you want my free video gift. And it is a um, introduction to orgasmic yoga, which you can do online from the privacy of your home. So uh, a primary resource is the Surrogate Partner Collective surrogatepartnercollective.com. They're a training and certifying body. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a horde of articles and resources relevant to surrogate partner therapy on there, so that it's kind of like a like a one-stop shop. The other would be Embrace Embrace uh, SPT Resource Group, which is what I serve on the board of. Very similar, and, and Embrace is, is actually intended more for um, other practitioners and clinicians. Um, and we just launched uh, uh, a client information group 
that clients can come to anonymously twice a month to ask questions and learn about SPT. And uh, we also launched a clinical collaboration group, which I, which I co-facilitate uh, for clinicians with uh, current um, or future SPT clients or who are, are wondering if they, if they might be a good fit to work in the traumatic model. And that's twice a month now too. And then the links are on the, the website, embracespt.org. Okay. If you want more localized stuff here, come up afterwards and we'll maybe have some additional. I'm from Colorado, thank you so much. No, we've got stuff all over the country. Yeah, okay. yeah. like I'm based in Chicago and Los Angeles, so. Yeah, click through to those resources because that, that uh, everything that we've mentioned is on that list, plus more. Um, I just had a question on how and or if you like transition the client back from a space of like healing their traumatic past to when they get to the point where they depend on you for like the touch or like the arousal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. When do we transition out or do we find that once someone has gone through healing work they are dependent? And I, uh, there's a couple different answers to this, but in my space, because it's for them, one of the questions when we're talking about transference is how is it functioning in your life? Are you coming here as a way, um, and is this, is this space that we're creating together knowing the container will never change? The container is never gonna change. Knowing that, is it preventing you from having other relationships? How are we celebrating when you are applying these things that we're practicing, how are we celebrating when you apply it other places? How are we using this space as your um, gentle pillow to fall on when you've tried those things and they went interestingly. They didn't go like they go in the session. So we, we orient the work to it and if it is in any way detrimental, so some, I've, I've had the experience where someone will um, get really attached and we have a very earnest conversation of like you are allowed to um, have feelings of being in love you're allowed to have all these feelings we can embrace them again we go back to what the container is going to be what our actions are going to be because desires are great to have I can sit here and near like have a wonderful experience of desire without ever doing anything about it so if it prevents them or causes more anxiety then good if it's causing more um, distraction um, then what they, they've stated their goals are then we talk about referring out or what other options there are we always orient towards again it's for them it's not for me so if it's not actively for them it's not serving them then you readjust for sure it's part of what's offered by the triadic models that I'm in I'm in communication with a the therapist at all times right so we are really collaborating on uh, what were the incoming goals? Have the goals changed? Right? Have we met certain objectives? Has the, has the client uh, reached a place where they're actually uh, uh, they are more ready than maybe even they're you know they uh, they feel or are ready to um, to own? And, and I talk about this in real time with the client. If I suspect it, I'll bring it up. Um, one thing I'm not going to do is try and protect or rescue the client from grief and from the, the loss, the gift of termination. There's a gift there. How many times in our lives do we have a relationship that we know it's going to end once it's reached a certain point and we have a built-in support network that has been, that has witnessed that entire relationship the entire time that supports the transition now out into the world. There's a gift in there. It can be incredibly messy and painful, but I'd rather choose the pain of that and this is something I have to sign up for as a practitioner because my feelings are also a part of this. I'm willing to show up to that and to bear in my own loss and my own grief with my own support network, right? And I know the client is gonna to have to do the same thing. And that's, that's the only way that we can transition out. I would be betraying them if I tried to protect them from it. I'm so shocked no one's asked about the legality question. You guys just like really. I'm curious about it. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. I know. It's like you have bets going. Like yeah. I lost five bucks to this. Is it legal? Is it legal? Yeah. 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 Yes. 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 The short answer is yes. I can go into a whole thing, but the short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. It's therapy.
are you opposed to going into like a little bit of the things? Sure. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, SPT is legal because uh, anything that doesn't have an explicit uh, criminal code assigned to it is legal, and SPT does not. SPT is not criminalized. There is no legislature that outlaws surrogate partner therapy. It doesn't fall into the confines of prostitution laws because the touch and if indicated, first of all, sex is not always a part of the trajectory. It happens maybe 60% of the time. And on top of that, the erotic relationship is not transactional. The client does not come to me saying, I want to do this thing, I want you to do this thing, and then give me money and I do the thing. That's not what happens. Our erotic relationship arises out of a long, built relationship that has a therapeutic container and goal. So put it additionally, put it another way, it's not money for sex. It's money for therapy. That could include sex. Right. And you said something about like in Washington, Oregon, where you practice the theory to the like the penetrative parts yeah. of the so I assume that that varies by state in terms of practice right. or being able to do that on Washington and Oregon have a little I guess I would say around if it's for educational purposes, sexual touches for educational purposes as well. But it's, you know, it's a thing to skate. It's a little, it's a little, it's a little rainbow. <laughs> That's what I would say. Um, and I just had a client who was coming from Idaho to Washington, had a conversation with him. I always do a free 15 minute consult. He was totally just, he just wanted to be seen and um, paid and then got, got, got scared and canceled. And I, and I refunded. You know, I don't want, you have to be ready for this work. It's not something that is, uh, it's, not a walk, it's not easy. It's not, all, it's not all roses and daffodils, right? There's some real, real work that's happening. And so, um, it's a, you're, it's a, you gotta, it's a choice. So, um, yeah, it's a, great, it's a great question. But for most of our clients, well, for all of my clients, people who actually come to see me, right, don't camp, it's worth the risk. It's worth the risk because it's so helpful. And, and in the vein of risk awareness, this is, we are speaking to that from a, the precedent. No one's ever been arrested or prosecuted for SPT. Oh, yeah, Brian always says that. Yeah, yeah. no one's ever been arrested or prosecuted. However, yeah. that doesn't mean that if some community member feels personally wronged in some egregious way by some means of whatever can't go on a uh, like their free time and do everything in their power to persecute someone. That's always a possibility, but it's a possibility with nearly everything. But having that risk awareness of like that doesn't that doesn't negate the veracity of people's actions when they feel wounded or hurt or whatnot. It's just very, very rare that we come across it because we're pretty full of it. And I do, even though I don't work in a triadic model, uh, I do have clients who want information to be shared between me and their therapist. So there, there is documentation that you know we can each fill out that allows that to happen. I do get a number of referrals from therapists, and sometimes therapists will say, you know, I'm, I can't refer to a particular person, but they'll say to their client, here's a here's the SSEA website, or here's the Sexological Body Worker website, pick somebody who's certified, right, from these lists. And that's that's kind of a way to skate around that a little bit, yeah. Are there any options for like a 17 year old senior, you know, who's looking for how, like, a kid, legally? Not in our world. Y'all talk about the um, typical demographics of y'all's clients and yeah, demographics. Like specifically, is it a bunch of white people? Yes. Yes. No. 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 But yes. But hold on one second, because I just want to circle back. Scarlet Teen, which you probably already know of, is a great resource for it teens. Is. No. Scarletteen.com. Awesome. There are a number of resources, just not hands-on body work. So, not just sorry. like white, but also um, like class structure, and all, like across the, the spectrum of demographics. Yeah. 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 And country. I mean, state. Yeah. State? Yeah. Across yeah. the United States, but there will be different concentrations. But um, each of people's individual practices are different. 
In terms of um, the practitioner base of Cuddleist, we have got probably, what do you think, 14%? That's a very specific number. Oh. <laughs> under 20%. Under, under 20% of our practitioners are folks of color. Um, and for my personal practice, it depends on who you target, like who your demo is, and I work with mostly um, neurodivergent, queer, uh, and folks with trauma backgrounds. And so in that demographic, it is mostly white, not entirely. It is um, actually a little bit skews because of the queer uh, neurodivergent space that I frequently occupy. It actually cues lower, lower sec. Um, and I, I accommodate with sliding scale as much as possible. But yeah, I would love to, I would highly recommend taking in a look at Amina Peterson with Cuddlesage, who's doing specifically uh, black women-centered cuddle therapy work and touch work, also the founder of Atlanta Tantra Institute. Can I add one more? For, yeah, for sure. Um, so there are people who are trying to help balance those scales. And while an individual practitioner may have a wide variety of races that they see, the overwhelming access to this work for all of the reasons, perceptive, uh, culturally perceptive, financial barrier, et cetera, um, is overwhelmingly white and other class. There's an organization out of LA called The Chronically Undertouched that is specifically working with giving black males platonic touch yeah. with other black men. The Chronically mm -hmm. Undertouched. Has uh, now has just launched um, for their training curriculum, um, uh, BIPOC in class based uh, reductions in the tuition, and uh, also a, a small stipend for folks who need help even just getting to the training. It's an in person training, right? So they they have a fund campaign for that, and this is this is to help diversify the field, right? So that people have access to the training. Embrace organization is going to be launching a client fund to help subsidize the cost for clients to access certain partner therapy. And in my own work, uh, I use a fee scale that slides both up and down. And so I have clients, and, I, and it's a form, a series of questions. I don't check people's work. I just give it to them. They tell me, and it has the tiers listed. They tell me what tier they're on. Uh, and if I'm full at a certain tier, I let them know. But that way, I have clients who pay 200% of what my standard rate would be, and I have clients who pay 50%. And, and because I because I, I do it that way, it, it all kind of comes out in a wash, right? But I'm not, I'm not arbitrating, like, who gets the sliding scale. So, that's so it's 4 o'clock. Yeah, I think we're at time. Thank you all so much for being here. On the handout, one of them is a sign-up sheet. We'll give you some more information on triad model, cuddling, FPT work. The other is a, a Google Drive that has some additional info and resources. You can watch some videos on that Google Drive link. It's available to you. And our info is on there too. Please come up to me in person. I'm much better one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> 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 